Good morning and good afternoon to everyone joining us today. And thank you very much for attending our webcast, uh, in which we're going to be talking about emerging trends for disaster recovery and how you can prepare. Uh, there's quite a bit to cover. Uh, and uh, my name is Christophe Bertrand, and I'm the VP of Product Marketing at ArcServe, and I'll be joined today by, by Mike Osterman, who is the president of uh, Osterman Research. Uh, and Mike is going to take us through uh, a lot of great data points and current trends in the space of disaster recovery and business continuity. Uh, as we're going through uh, the presentation, we would love to answer your questions. So please go ahead and send them to us using the question section in your uh, interface. And uh, we will uh, answer them uh, at the end of the event. Um, maybe I'll interrupt Mike a couple of times depending on the questions, but uh, please stay to the end because there will be definitely some uh, answers to your questions at the end. Uh, this session is uh, being recorded. So uh, what we'll do is we'll send you an email uh, shortly after the um, uh, the end of the uh, uh, webcast uh, with uh, to the email address that you registered with. So uh, uh, you'll get access to that link. So uh, with this, I'd like to uh, get us started. Uh, I'm going to cover uh, just one quick slide about ArcServe and, and who we are, if uh, you don't know us yet. Uh, we're essentially a global company. We've been in a space of uh, backup disaster recovery uh, and business continuity for a long time. Uh, more recently, as an independent company, uh, we have many uh, thousands of customers around the world. And because we're a global company, uh, it gives us a very good perspective on what's going on in the space of, uh, of disaster recovery, the type of challenges that our customers face across uh, many uh, geographies, topologies, you name it. Uh, we're headquartered in uh, Minneapolis uh, in the US, but we have uh, also a presence around the world, as you can see. Uh, we're actually distributed in uh, over 150 countries and uh, have many, many partners uh, uh, who help us uh, do so. Uh, we're very proud of our technology. We've uh, been recognized with many awards. We have a very modern set of solutions that range from software to appliances to services, included disaster, including disaster recovery as a service. Uh, so again, very modern architectures, great technology, and many customers enjoying uh, uh, great RPOs and RTOs uh, with our solution. So uh, with this in mind, I'd like to, at this point, uh, turn it over to Mike, who is going to take us uh, through some great research. Well, Christoph, thank you very much, and I'd like to thank everyone who's here on the call with us today. Uh, we'll be discussing the results of a survey that we did for ArcServe and really discussing the whole uh, a number of issues around disaster recovery, things that really are near and dear to our heart and, and I'm sure to most of you as well. So just a little bit about Osterman Research. We're an independent market research and consulting firm. And our focus really is on, you know, ostensibly messaging web and collaboration, but we really look at anything that impacts the way uh, people communicate and collaborate. So we look obviously at things like security, encryption, archiving, content management, uh, disaster recovery is a key issue that we cover uh, as well, you know, simply because it impacts the way that we communicate or collaborate. Uh, we have a very strong emphasis on primary research, and we'll be going through a lot of that here in today's session. Uh, the company is coming up on 17 years old and we're based near Seattle. So a little bit about the survey. Uh, we did a survey in October of 2017 and we spoke with 125 uh, organizations. Really wanted to focus on the mid-market. Uh, so organizations that had between 100 and 2,500 employees. Uh, as you can see here, our, our target base is between 200 and 2,500. And we wanted to talk to specific people within those organizations. So obviously the organization had to have some sort of a disaster recovery or business continuity solution already in place. Um, they al already had to have established disaster recovery practices. This wasn't something that they just plugged in and, and forgot about. They had to be actively involved in disaster recovery. And the people we spoke to had to be very knowledgeable about the disaster recovery solution that had been implemented uh, and all the processes that were in place. So we wanted to talk really to the, the subject matter experts, if you will, within the, these organizations. Uh, these organizations were all based in the United States uh, and we designed it that way simply uh, you know, as part of the methodology so that we were focusing on a single geographic area. 
So, you know, is disaster recovery important? Well, you know, the obvious answer is yes. Uh, you know, if you ask that question, just about everybody is going to say yes, because we all have systems that we rely on uh, on a regular basis, whether it's email or Salesforce or you know, any of a hundred different applications. We rely on those on a regular basis to get work done in our organizations. So, you know, is disaster recovery important? Of course, it is to everybody. What we found, though, is that for 67% of the organizations in, in late 2017, they said that it was absolutely essential to their business, uh, largely because organizations rely on things on a minute-by-minute -minute basis, whether that's email or CRM or some sort of an ERP system or e-commerce you know, transaction process and what have you, uh, disaster recovery is absolutely essential. If you're down for a half hour, an hour, you know, half a day, what have you, uh, things can, can blow up very, very quickly. Uh, we've seen that in a number of cases you know, in a wide variety of industries. Uh, British Airways, for example, recently had a, a meltdown in its ticketing system, and it delayed you know, literally thousands of flights and tens of thousands of passengers. So we're looking at, at obviously, disaster recovery as being essential. What we're finding, though, Though, is that by the end of 2018, the organizations we spoke to uh, will even more uh, place more importance on disaster recovery. So 78% are going to perceive uh, disaster recovery as absolutely essential to their business by the end of this year. And we expect this trend to continue, particularly as, as organizations move more and more to the cloud, their tolerance for, um, for downtime is, is really getting uh, smaller and smaller, as we'll see here in just a bit. So certainly, you know, we, we'll probably never get to 100 percent because there are always some organizations out there that you know won't necessarily rely completely on their systems uh, you know those that are not as technologically advanced or or still re rely on older systems what have you but really the vast majority are becoming more and more reliant on these systems and so disaster recovery is becoming more important What we also found is that the recovery time objective and the recovery point objective are getting shorter. What we found in 2017, for example, is, uh, and these are, are uh, figures in minutes, uh, the, the RTO in, uh, the mean RTO in 2017 was 436 minutes, dropping to only 201 minutes in 2018. The RPO was 500 minutes in 2017, dropping to 241 minutes uh, in, by the end of 2018. And if you look at the median figures, which is probably a more accurate uh, representation of what organizations are looking at, at. We're looking at both RTO and R RPO uh, basically dropping in half over that over that one year period. So the ability to recover very quickly from a disaster or any kind of a glitch, whether it's a hard disk failure or a natural disaster, uh, the the RTO and RPO are getting significantly shorter. And we would expect this trend to continue over time. If we were to look out three or four years, we would expect these figures to be actually be very small. Uh, and is significantly smaller than what we're seeing here, largely because organizations are becoming more reliant on their systems, they're becoming more customer facing. And also, you know, again, as I mentioned, as organizations move more and more to the cloud, they expect those cloud providers to provide carrier grade service. Uh, they don't expect that there's going to be an hour downtime in their, uh, their cloud-based email, for example, or in Salesforce or any of the other cloud-based systems that they're using. They're going to expect very very, very short periods of downtime, if even that. We also found in the survey that disaster recovery capabilities really are a fundamental way that organizations are combating ransomware. And we'll get into some ransomware stats on the next slide. But what we found is that more, more than four in five uh, of the organizations that we surveyed views disaster recovery as either an important or as an essential tool in recovering from ransomware. We found, for example, that 36% view DR as absolutely essential to recovering from ransomware. And what we found, and we've done a lot of ransomware research, one of the things we found is that organizations have invested a lot of money in anti-ransomware technology, technology designed to really detect ransomware before it uh, impacts even one endpoint on the network, uh, technology that's designed to prevent the spread of ransomware to other endpoints once it has infected one endpoint and so forth. But those technologies are not foolproof. Uh, ransomware is still getting through, not only through email, which is, is still the primary way that it gets through, 
but also, also through things like mobile devices, social media channels, uh, files that are sent from home computers and so forth. Uh, USB sticks is, you know, is another way that, that ransomware spreads. So we're seeing uh, the ability to recover uh, from a backup. Uh, from from a known good state as an essential element in recovering from ransomware. And just about every organization out there that has addressed the ransomware issue through technology also views backup and recovery and primarily disaster recovery as an essential element in uh, recovering from a ransomware attack. So what we're seeing is that, you know, while today it's only 36% that view uh, disaster recovery as an absolutely essential way to recover from ransomware, we anticipate that number is going to grow dramatically over the next couple of years, largely as organizations implement both anti-ransomware technologies and very rapid uh, disaster recovery and backup capabilities so that they can recover quickly. What we found in our ransomware research is that a lot of organizations have simply had to shut down for a few days while they recover from ransomware. And this has been particularly problematic for things like hospitals uh, that, that have sh had to shut down their, their electronic systems for a week or more in some cases. Uh, Hollywood Presbyterian, for example, in February of 2015, suffered a ransomware attack and they resorted to paper-based systems for about a week. And so that means that you're, you're doing things like delaying surgeries, you're stopping non-essential procedures and so forth, and it really is putting lives at risk. And so organizations are, are certainly taking ransomware seriously today. They will be doing so even more in the future, largely because of the, the implications of it. So, you know, certainly ransomware is growing. Uh, you see it not only in the trade press, but also in the popular press. Um, in 2016, for example, ransomware increased by 600% over the year before, and in 2017, it increased by 2,500%. Now, we're probably not going to see 2,500% growth this year, but I'd be surprised if we saw anything less than three to 500% uh, in ransomware growth. Um, if you look at the way cyber criminals are operating, uh, you know, they have been so successful over the last several years in stealing records. Uh, things like credit card numbers, medical records, passport numbers, you know, whatever, you know, whatever is of value to them, is that there is such a glut on the on the black market now of of these credentials and these credit card numbers and so forth that the value of them has gone down. And so, you know, a credit card number uh, that was selling for maybe twenty five dollars five years ago is selling for just a few dollars today. So, what a lot of cyber criminals have done is turn to things like ransomware so that they can steal. Uh, from victims directly. Instead of seal, stealing something they have that's of value, like a, a passport number, and then selling it on the black market, they now steal from people directly. And ransomware is an effective way to do that. And what we've seen is, particularly among Russian-speaking uh, cyber gangs, uh, they tend to be very cooperative, and they really do help each other out. They work um, in very collaborative ways and, and, and share their knowledge. They share their technology. So ransomware is becoming more sophisticated, harder to detect, and we're going to see continued problems with ransomware over the next several years. Uh, you know, we would expect at least two to 300% uh, growth per year over the next three to four years, for example. What we also found in the survey we did for ArcServe is that the tolerance for data loss is very low. And what we did in the survey is, is ask respondents, okay, you know, what is your primary application? You know, think of the thing that you absolutely rely on, whether it's email or Salesforce or, you know, whatever the case may be. What is your secondary application? Something in which you can tolerate a little bit more downtime, a little bit less access on a, on a real time basis. And then what's your tertiary applications? Things you don't necessarily use all that often. And then we wanted to find out what the tolerance was for data loss in each of those types of applications. And we let the respondents define what those might be. Uh, we did not define it for them. What we found is that in the primary applications that they were using, uh, and very often this is email, 95% said that they can tolerate no data loss or only minimal data loss. Only 5% said that they could tolerate, quote unquote, reasonable data loss. But even for tertiary applications, uh, things that, that uh, users don't rely on nearly as much as the primary application, we still found very low tolerance for data loss. 
So 83% of respondents said that even for their tertiary applications, uh, they can tolerate no or only minimal data loss. So fundamentally, what we're seeing is that even for low priority applications, there's really not much very tolerance, not much at all, uh, tolerance for data loss. And in the primary applications, uh, there's virtually no tolerance for it. And we would expect this to continue over time, you know, particularly as organizations move to the cloud, as they, you know, again, as they move to more customer facing applications and so forth, the tolerance for data loss is lower and lower. And we see this particularly in organizations that are more heavily regulated, whether it's healthcare, financial services, life sciences, energy, you know, what have you. Uh, the, the tolerance for data loss is very low because it's not only an issue of, of maintaining data for the business itself, but it's also satisfying regulators. It's satisfying all of these regulatory obligations. And as we see things like the general data protection regulation, the GDPR in Europe or the European Union take hold, uh, we're going to see this more and more, that organizations are going to become more reliant on ensuring that data loss is kept uh, at zero or as low as possible. We also asked about complete disaster recovery. And by that, we mean the ability really to have full access to all business applications within a very short period of time. And we defined that as five minutes or less. Uh, and we asked organizations, you know, just how important is this? Uh, is it important to have, you know, quote unquote, full access to all the business applications, or can you tolerate, you know, some reasonable level of disruption? And what we found is that, you know, because the cost of this is, is going to be higher in many cases, uh, lots of organizations are willing to compromise and say, okay, you know, we'll accept good disaster recovery, but not something necessarily that gets us up in, back in, in five minutes or less. We did find, however, that in 2017, uh, close to one in five organizations said that they do want full disaster recovery. By the end of 2018, however, 26% uh, said that they're going to want full disaster recovery. So we're, again, this could ties back into the, the, the low tolerance for data loss. Organizations absolutely need to get things up and running as quickly as possible. And that's not only access to the system itself, but access to all of the data that they've been processing. So we're seeing lower and lower tolerance over time for any kind of data loss. Uh, and, and certainly we'll see this trend continue. If we were to project this out to, uh, you know, let's say 2022, for example, we would expect over 50% of organizations to be represented in the yellow bars, to have very, very low tolerance for data loss and the need to get back up and running very quickly. We also wanted to ask about delivery models for disaster recovery. And what we found in 2017, and again, this is October 2017, um, is that 36% of the organizations we surveyed had only an on-premises uh, disaster recovery solution. 8% had cloud only, but 56% had a hybrid. They had a combination of both on-premises solutions and cloud-based solutions. What we're finding though is that the market is, is shifting decidedly toward the cloud. Uh, cloud only disaster recovery, for example, is going to more than double this year, and hybrid is also going to take a significant jump. And again, that's you know largely at the expense of on-premises solution uh, solutions. These solutions that are are uh, you know being phased out as they get older. These legacy solutions that that don't necessarily satisfy all the demands of the organization. And certainly we see a lot more emphasis on cloud, largely because more and more organizations are moving their primary applications to the cloud. We're seeing things like Office 365 and Salesforce and you know, literally a hundred different applications that are moving to the cloud that just a few years ago would have been supported primarily by on-premises solutions. So you know, certainly we will expect the, the, the cloud and the hybrid trend to continue uh, very significantly over time. So why would an organization want disaster recovery in the cloud? Well, you know, certainly there's an absolute need for geo redundancy, uh, particularly if you're in a place like Florida that goes through hurricanes or in Tornado Alley or in California where there are fires and earthquakes. Uh, you know, there, there are disasters just about everywhere, but particularly in areas that suffer uh, significant natural disasters and especially on a regular basis, uh, you absolutely want to have all of your data and your applications, if possible, somewhere else. Uh, if you can get things up and running somewhere else very quickly, uh, you, you're back in business uh, after a natural disaster much more quickly than if you're using on-premises solutions. Uh, we have clients in Tampa, for example, 
that were out of power for a week uh, after the the hurricanes uh, earlier this or in, in 2017. So, you know, we're seeing major business impact from natural disasters, but also from things like power outages and, and really just a wide variety of things that can happen. So one of the fundamental advantages of DR in the cloud is, is that your data and your applications are somewhere else and it gets you back up and running very quickly. We also find that a growing proportion of IT teams, IT teams are following their workload. So, you know, certainly if, we, if you can get that workload somewhere else, uh, again, you have advantages uh, in, in doing that by using disaster recovery in the cloud. Again, RTOs and RPOs are getting shorter. You can achieve uh, much faster recovery in many cases if you don't have an on-premises disaster recovery solution and instead have something in the cloud that isn't requiring your IT team to manage it and other problems as they come up. Also, we find that employees are working remotely more often. Uh, you know, certainly we've heard cases where there's been a trend away from that over the past couple of years in organizations like Yahoo and IBM, where they're sort of retracting from those uh, original positions of allowing employees to work from anywhere. But still, we're seeing more of a trend uh, for employees to work uh, in, in a distributed way. So the ability for them to get up and running quickly with a cloud-based disaster recovery solution uh, is enhanced when compared to on-premises. And also what we found in the research is that cloud-based disaster recovery is viewed as a better way to recover from ransomware. Again, because you're not relying on a single on-premises solution in, a, in one place to recover, but now you can rely on the cloud-based disaster recovery solution provider to get things back up and running very quickly. And so if you have distributed employees, you have a distributed opportunity, if you will, for ransomware attacks, and cloud-based DR simply works better in most cases. So in terms of predictions for 2018, and you know, obviously this is the time of year when, when lots of organizations do their predictions, uh, you know, but, but we have a, a number of predictions in the context of disaster recovery. Uh, you know, the, the easiest one is to say that ransomware is going to get much worse. Uh, you know, again, we'll, we expect a minimum of 300% increase in uh, 2018 over 2017. I would expect that to get be even quite a bit higher, at least 500%. Uh, so we will see ransomware continue to be a top of mind problem for just about every organization out there. And the impact on disaster recovery is going to be significant. Uh, organizations are going to need a way to get, you know, once they've been infected, to get back to a known good state very rapidly. And uh, disaster recovery, in particular cloud-based disaster recovery, is a very good way to do that. Mobile is going to be a much greater threat conduit into the enterprise. Uh, you know, we're, we're relying more and more on mobile devices. And, and certainly, I think we're going to see more mobile attacks against the enterprise, uh, where users download maybe a copycat application or their data is somehow infected and it gets back into the corporate network through a mobile device. And again, the impact on, on disaster recovery is going to be significant because a lot of that is going to be ransomware coming into the organization. A lot of it is going to be uh, data stealing, malware, that kind of thing. We're also going to see a dramatic increase uh, in, in the context of threats for the Internet of Things. Uh, we're seeing more and more things, if you will, whether it's, it's uh, you know, routers or video cameras or, you know, whatever the device is. We're seeing a, a huge increase in the number of these things in the enterprise and also in the home that potentially could impact the enterprise. So a home alarm system, for example, that gets infected could infect a work PC that's brought home and thereby get into the corporate network when the user connects back in. Again, big impact on disaster recovery because you're going to have to recover from these, these attacks that occur. Uh, I'm also predicting that a cyber attack is going to take down a U.S. utility. Uh, we saw this in the Ukraine in 2015 where a utility was taken down. It impacted 230,000 customers. We've seen some kinds of you know, similar types of things in the Northeast. Uh, you know, certainly I think we're, we are going to see a, a U.S. utility get taken down this year uh, through some sort of a cyber attack. And it's probably going to be, you know, a relatively minor event in the great in the grand scheme of things but we are going to see i think several hundred thousand customers being impacted which you know fundamentally will be a wake up call for the industry to take security more seriously and you know certainly the industry is is taking it seriously now the utility industry but i think it's going to to spread beyond that. We're all going to see a utility takedown as an opportunity, if you will, to implement disaster recovery and insulate ourselves from that kind of attack. 
the GDPR is going to introduce significant pain. Uh, as I mentioned, if you're not familiar with it, the, the General Data Protection Regulation, or GDPR, is uh, uh, basically an enhancement of the existing data protection laws in the European Union. Uh, the GDPR goes into effect on May 25th of this year, and essentially it imposes major penalties on organizations that don't appropriately manage their data. So if you have personal data on a resident of the European Union, you have to take special precautions to protect that. You have to really just do a wide variety of things to ensure that that data can't be breached. And the fines for violating GDPR can actually be as high as 4% of your annual revenue for the year before, or 20 million euros, whichever is higher. So we're looking at major pain that's going to be introduced by the GDPR, uh, not only in the context of penalties, but also in the context of just general data protection. Organizations are going to have to, to take extra uh, steps to protect their data uh, if it's, if it's uh, held on a European data resident. Also, the frequency of data breaches is going to accelerate. Uh, you know, this is an easy one to predict because we've seen it over the past several years. Uh, certainly, we'll, we'll expect data breaches to continue uh, at, at a fairly rapid pace. Uh, we're seeing this a lot in the healthcare industry. We're seeing it, you know, obviously in, in organizations like Equifax and so forth. Uh, and again, the, the impact on data recovery uh, or disaster recovery is, is not going to be as significant for protecting against data breaches as it might be in some of these other areas. But if is going to be important. Uh, organizations are going to have to be able to protect their data and do whatever they can to protect against data breaches. So in terms of recommendations, uh, you know, certainly this is going to, any recommendation we could offer is going to vary depending upon the organization, where you are in your disaster recovery journey and so forth. But certainly we would highly recommend that you review current status for just about everything in your organization from an IT perspective. Uh, look at your security. Uh, how well protected are you against ransomware? How well protected are you against data breaches? Uh, what kind of reporting mechanisms do you have? What kind of intrusion prevention systems do you have? What have you? Look at your disaster recovery and business continuity plans. How quickly can you you recover from a disaster right now and that's not only a you know hurricane blowing through town but it's also you know what happens if you have a server failure somewhere a power outage you know whatever the case may be a ransomware attack how quickly can you recover how how well are you able to satisfy all of your compliance obligations and not only things like gdpr but also all of the regulations that might be specific to your industry or just your corporate policies you know how can you satisfy all of those compliance obligations and then what level of employee training do you have? Um, you know, do employees know what to do after a ransomware attack? Do they know what to do when a system goes down? Uh, you know, do they know, do they know how to, to address phishing attacks and so forth? Also give disaster recovery and business continuity a very high priority. One of the things we found in the survey, for example, is that IT finds it to be a lot easier to sell disaster recovery to senior management, to, to business management, after a disaster has occurred, you know, after the ransomware attack, after the natural disaster. That really shouldn't be the case. Organizations need to be a little bit more forward thinking and say, okay, we need to implement disaster recovery. We need to give it a high priority before the disaster occurs, not just as a response to something bad that happens. And then finally, consider the best delivery model for either deploying or upgrading whatever disaster recovery and business continuity solution you might already have in place. And if you don't have one in place, uh, you know, really focus on, on getting one in place very quickly. Okay, and that concludes my presentation. Christoph, I'm going to hand the floor back to you. Thank you very much, Mike. And uh, we have a few questions, so um, uh, I'm going to start covering them here with your help, Mike. Uh, I think some of them will be uh, maybe uh, maybe we'll tag team on those, uh, and I will start with um, one question that is very specific about a comment you made around utilities, uh, and it's about the um, NERC or NERC regulations for electric utilities in North America. What what do you know about those? I think that's uh, um, something you, you you brought up. Yeah, I, I'm I'm not an expert in, uh, by any means in in uh, the NERC or or the FERC uh, regulations, but certainly, I mean, th there are uh, 
there are issues in place today. I mean, th there are practices that our utilities are following to protect against cyber attack. And you know, I, I didn't mean to imply that utilities are are asleep at the switch because they're certainly not. They are addressing these issues, um, but there are a number of things that utilities need to do to provide better protection against cyber attack. Uh, I was talking to somebody from a, a, a local utility some time back. And he said that just in, in going through their logs, he found Chinese IP addresses, uh, people who had logged in. He had no idea who they were and was really quite fearful that they could you know, launch some sort of attack. Uh, they never had. But he was he was really quite fearful and had no idea how how these uh, people had accessed uh, th their network. So, you know, certainly I think that there's a lot more that needs to be done. And, you know, Particularly in the case of utilities, it is such a part of our, our critical infrastructure element that that uh, you know we do need to give it a very high priority. And you know, government is to some extent uh, probably not as much as it needs to be, but uh, you know, certainly, I mean, it is it is getting a lot of attention. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, another question that's very interesting. So, how quickly should I target to recover after a ransomware attack? I'll, I'll give you a quick answer. I think it depends, but uh, Mike, maybe you have some thoughts on this. Yeah, it's it, it depends on you know what what you're you're looking at in the context of what got attacked. For example, if you're dealing with a, a member of the clerical staff and they had a ransomware attack and their their machine is now locked out, uh, you know obviously you you take the machine offline as quickly as possible so that that ransomware infection cannot spread. Um, you know, and, and if you got that machine back up in four hours, eight hours, it probably wouldn't be injurious to the business to to take that long to do it. If you're dealing, however, with a server that, that gets taken out with ransomware and that, you know, is, is processing uh, customer transactions, obviously you want to get that, that up and running as quickly as possible. And one of the issues you want to address as well is not only the ability to get that back up quickly, but also to isolate that machine. Because one of the things that ransomware does now, the more sophisticated ransomware, is it not only infects the machine and encrypts all of the files on the local machine, but it also goes after backups. And so if you are relying on just a backup strategy, not a, a true disaster recovery solution, but just a backup, uh, you can get your backups infected with ransomware as well. And so you can't recover to a known good state. So, you know, what we recommend is, is having a, you know, not only very good backups that are isolated from the endpoints that are infected, but also having a very good disaster recovery solution that is insulated from, uh, from the endpoints. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so there's a question that came through that was a very interesting one. Um, are you saying that you should always have your recovery data off-premises? versus on-premise, I guess. Yeah, I, I, I probably wouldn't go so far as to say always, but I think it's a very good idea. Um, you know, certainly geo-redundancy is, is, you know, clearly a best practice. You know, having something in a distant location uh, that's insulated from, uh, you know, whatever power outage you might have locally or, you know, if there's a natural disaster, fire, you know, whatever the case may be. Having those backups remote, I think, is, a, is, is really a... Uh, sort of a top line best practice. Is it absolutely essential to have, you know, the five minute backup isolated? You know, not necessarily, but but certainly you want to have backups in a in a distant location so that you can recover uh, fairly quickly. Yeah, that's exactly what I would say. I would say you you should absolutely always have a copy off premise. Actually, there is a a whole a process for having you know multiple copies, multiple locations, multiple versions, and one that's always offline. Uh, so um, definitely, it's a good practice. I would I would certainly uh, you know uh, agree with that. Uh, very uh, interesting question. What is a good RPO for a 700 uh, people company? So I guess uh, so one of our uh, listeners is, is uh, in company that's about 700 people. And let me take this real quick, and then uh, Mike, maybe you can uh, go back to the data you, you, you studied, but and your research. But a good RPO, I'm going to tell you, tell you it's kind of what I said before. It kind of depends. A good RPO is whatever is not going to be harmful to your business, and whatever you can achieve having that trade-off of investment versus cost that you know Mike brought up. Uh, so if you want to be current in the data you recover, you want to be a few minutes behind, 15 minutes behind, 20 minutes behind, something like that, you can leverage a cloud solution like the one Arcsurf has. If you want to be 
uh, always um, almost always caught up. You're going to be looking at investing a lot more uh, with a high availability type of solution uh, that may be on-premise, but it may be a very good thing. It depends on the business pain and the application criticality, and that's really what determines what a good RPO is, um, as well as any other commitment you may have from a commercial standpoint in terms of service levels, in terms of supply chain, uh, internally and externally. So, uh, and Mike, do you have any uh, additional points on this? Yes, yeah, and, and I would agree with that. I mean, it depends really on the application. Um, if you're dealing, let's say, with a customer-facing system, you know, some sort of transaction processing that's generating, let's say, $100,000 an hour in business for your company, obviously, the, the faster, the better. Uh, if you're dealing with a, a low-priority application, you, you may be able to tolerate 60 minutes of, of data loss. Um, it depends also on the level to which you're regulated. For example, in the financial services space, uh, broker dealers, investment advisors, and so forth have to maintain a record of all of their communications with customers. And so you, you can't have gaps in the archive, if you will, of those communications. Uh, you can't have a, you know, 60 minute gap where your broker dealers were communicating with customers and you don't have a record of it in the archive. So it, you know, it depends to some extent on the industry you're in and, you know, how much revenue you're generating and so forth. But, you know, certainly the shorter the better, but it's going to, you know, as Christoph said, it's going to depend uh, really on a case by case basis, uh, you know, how, how quickly you do need to recover. Okay, thank you. Um, so a couple more questions. Uh, let me look. Uh, okay, so that's a good question. What recovery time can you achieve with cloud versus in-house? So I guess meaning cloud versus on-premise. So, yeah, I, I, well, I'll, I'll defer to you, Christoph, because I, I don't think there's a hard and fast answer to that. Yeah, I'll tell you. So, so here's here's what I can tell you. Our technology can deliver um, from a recovery time objective, meaning the time that you get the system image back uh, ready to use. Typically, it's going to be a virtual machine that gets uh, that you stand up. Uh, if you're on premise, uh, it can be very quick. It's as quickly uh, as it takes for the VM to boot up, and you can have a virtual standby, which our technology allows to do. So, it, it will it will be a few minutes. If it's in the cloud. Uh, assuming you have good bandwidth, uh, which is, of course, always an assumption, but assuming you have good bandwidth, uh, it could be uh, five minutes. So uh, our technology can deliver RTOs in uh, the very, uh, in, in, in the sub five minutes on premise and certainly five minutes, or, you know, again, it varies uh, in the cloud as well. Again, bandwidth is going to be key here. Um, all right, let's do um, uh, one more question here and i'm sorry there are many questions coming coming up but we uh we only have so much time here today um so are there some specific industries that are more likely to be attacked by ransomware that's a good question uh, what we have seen is that the healthcare industry has been one of the primary targets for ransomware and uh healthcare organizations i think in 2017 um, at least in 2016, were the leading uh, victim of, of ransomware. And it's largely because uh, they're, they're so willing to pay, if you will, uh, because they do have to get back up and running very quickly and because lives are, are at issue if they're not up and running quickly. So they, they have tended to pay you know, really quite a bit. As I mentioned, the uh, the Hollywood Presbyterian case back in February of 2015, they paid uh, $17,000 in Bitcoin to to recover their files. We have seen a lot of, of NHS hospitals in the UK uh, that have been attacked with ransomware in 2016 and 2017. So, you know, for going forward in 2018, I would guess that healthcare would continue to be the primary victim, but I, I'm really not sure. I mean, I you know, just about everybody is is um, uh, you know, is a potential victim, but certainly those that are either in uh, uh, industries where lives are at, are at stake or where you're you're dealing with uh, large the large value of transactions. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, I mean, I think it's probably an equal opportunity offender, but yeah, if there's money, uh, there's ransomware. I think you can follow the money mm -hmm. on this one. Um, uh, I'm going to take a couple of product questions that have come up. Uh, actually, there's uh, there's one here around. Uh, you know, a quick one about trends uh, on, on backup and recovery. Are people moving away from backing up to tape? I will say yes. Uh, certainly, uh, that's the case. 
some people are still using tape. You can still use tape as one of those offline measures, as I, as I uh, indicated before. Uh, but I would say predominantly now uh, you're moving to cloud or you're moving or something going to disk as a first uh, stop. Uh, over questions around what happens if uh, a local uh, uh, backup gets, uh, you know, can it get compromised, uh, number one? And then what happens when you start replicating that off-site and can the infection get uh, across? So let me uh, cover a couple of scenarios here. Uh, first of all, if um, you get affected uh, or infected by ransomware locally, certainly you want to stop that infection from spreading locally. If you are actively replicating files that may have been infected, in, the, in other words, you're replicating the executable, the 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 backup process, uh, whether you're using our UDP on-premise or using our cloud direct, the backup process does not execute the, the executable, okay? So uh, by definition, you may be replicating a compromised file or an encrypted file potentially, but you will not necessarily be spreading, you will not be spreading it to the, the destination. What you need to do is go back to a point in time where the culprit was not in the system uh, so that it doesn't, you know, kind of start the whole thing all over again. Uh, now, there are best practices for not getting your backup uh, servers infected. Now, with Cloud Direct, we go straight to cloud, so uh, you don't have that, that on-premise uh, potential risk. We have best practices. We highly recommend uh, you pay attention to them, and if you do that, you will be fine. Uh, however, uh, you will hear a number of, of a number of uh, uh, sort of, of rumors out there, a number of People saying, hey, look, the backup servers can be affected uh, and infected, and it's happened uh, out there. Uh, again, if you don't pay attention, don't use best practices. If you start putting your backups on a backup sh on a share, for example, that can be accessed by pretty much anyone on the network. If you don't control uh, access, if you don't, uh, you know, control the networks and you know, leveraging subnets, etc. I mean, there are a number of things you can do. Now, uh, every platform can be infected, whether it's Linux or, or Windows. So that doesn't make any difference. As a matter of fact, there's a uh, I think predominance now of, of attacks on Linux servers. So you know, uh, follow the best practices by the backup vendor. We certainly have ours. Every backup vendor has them. And again, if you have a copy or multiple copies, which is what we recommend uh, off-site, what it does for you is that if should anything happen to that site and you need to shut it down and you need to just go to the backup or the recovery service site, you can run from there. Uh, so I hope it answers the question. And remember also when you're using a backup service or disaster recovery as a service, the type of security that's in place is really um, – uh, going to be different from what you have on premise. Not that your your on premise may not be adequate. I'm just saying it's going to be uh, hardened for you know large scale data center. We're talking very very serious type of security. Something that maybe maybe as a mid market organization you you don't have or can't really afford uh, as well as a larger scale data center has. So we we have a number of very specific very stringent security requirements in our data center. And again, remember if you if you if you do not execute the uh, the ransomware it, it, it will not spread, uh, which is of course one of the mechanisms uh, um, that that you need to be able to control. Um, so uh, there are people asking me questions around integration of uh, uh, of our solution in terms of uh, whether it's going to be integrated uh, in terms of the portfolio, and the answer is yes, absolutely. I cannot tell you more, but stay tuned. Uh, we are. Uh, absolutely um, converging, integrating our solutions, and, and we're going to give you a fantastic end user experience. Uh, and that's coming very soon, so stay tuned. There's a lot of stuff going on uh, in, the, in, the, in the back end here, and um, we, you'll get some updates from us in the next, next few weeks. Um, there was a, a final, maybe quick question for you. Um, uh, and I don't know if you have any statistics on this, Mike, is uh, what are the risks of the cloud storage being hacked? That's a great question. Um, you know, there, there's always some level of risk. I think, you know, certainly on, on average, there is less risk of cloud storage being hacked and probably significantly less risk. 
largely because leading cloud providers um, have the resources to invest in lots of technology to protect. And it's not only just in the in the logical technology to protect against intrusions and, and so forth, but it's also in the physical technology. Um, you know, the, the ability to limit access to server rooms, for example, where, where data is held and so forth. So, you know, on average, cloud providers tend to offer a better level of security than the typical on-premises solution. And you can just look at, at the major hacks that have occurred over the past few years. Most of those have been of on-premises solutions, not uh, not in the cloud. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, yeah, I think it's yeah, different, different, different scale of security and, and, and uh, uh, certainly a, a very different type of, of attacks, I think, also. Uh, great, well, you know, I'd like to thank everybody uh, for, uh, you know, joining us, and, and thank you, Mike, so much for sharing all of the details and answering the uh, uh, the questions and spending this time with us today. Uh, so again, we will be uh, sending out a recording of this presentation a little later today. So please uh, keep uh, an eye out for that. Uh, we will be using the email you provided us when you registered. Uh, and if you have any additional questions, please reach us um, at uh, arcsoft.com. Uh, give us a call. Uh, you can download a trial of our solutions. You can uh, chat live. So you can, of course, uh, you know, speak with us directly. So, uh, uh, Mike, uh, I'd like to uh, thank you again for your uh, uh, great presentation today. Thank you, everybody, for joining, and have a great rest of your day.